Systems that have been adapted from other industries that are not designed for cultivation are like fitting a square peg into a round hole. The fact is, cannabis is a living organism that has different environmental requirements based on its stage of life. It's not a, it's not a static load requirement like human-centric comfort cooling or an indoor pool facility. The 10 cardinal parameters work synergistically, and all of them need to be optimized to ensure crucial KPIs are met, such as grams per square foot and price per pound. HVACD tells the full story of what environmental control for cannabis should do. Sure, there's heat load from the lights it needs to be accounted for, but it takes about twice as much work to dehumidify than it does to remove heat. And through the process of transpiration, plants act as perfect little humidifiers in cultivation rooms, and without proper modulating dehumidification, humidity rates and VPD simply cannot be maintained. But we have a huge challenge here. How can you determine what a proper HVACD system looks like? How much should it cost? How do you compare competing systems on a true apples to apples basis? We're going to help answer these questions over the next 30 minutes as Adrian and Rob walk us through the concepts of a coordinated design process, the performance and cost differences of conventional non-integrated and integrated HVACD systems, and a crash course on leveling bids and important KPIs. With that, I'll pass it off to Adrian to get us started. Thank you, Brian. Indoor cannabis and horticulture projects are extremely complex. And in a way, we're constructing an entire campus in, a near, in nearly every building that's purpose built or retrofitted for indoor cultivation. And looking at this process map, courtesy of Anderson Porter Architects, you can see why they're so complex. Labor is one of the largest operational costs, so employee workflow is central to an optimized facility. In addition to that, you have lighting strategies, canopy area, cultivation methods and technologies, building envelope design, energy consumption, building management systems for data collection and control, maybe even on-site renewable energy and microgrid controls, all of which need to come together in harmony to meet your product output goals and meet your business metrics and KPIs that we will talk about later on. The use of a coordinated design process allows you the ability to assign resources according to the limited capital available to any project. Now let us dig in a bit into the two typical types of project delivery methods, as well as the type of team members that comprise an indoor horticulture project. Plan spec build on the top on the left is a more traditional approach that typically doesn't allow for as much collaboration between the design and construction teams but it doesn't have to be that way. You as the owner get to set the tone and the expectations for your project. If you want collaboration and want to work through an architect as the quarterback, it is very possible, but it needs to be set up that way from the start and the architect needs to be selected appropriately. An alternative method is design build. This method allows for the whole design and construction team to be brought under one contract and work collaboratively from the beginning. This is a true one throat to choke scenario, which works well for complex and fast paced projects. Regardless of the path you choose, it is imperative to ensure that each project team member has the requisite cannabis and horticulture intimacy to avoid costly and common mistakes. These professionals are somewhat rare in the wild, but they do exist. Regardless of where the recommendations come from, be sure to fully vet all project partners to the best of your ability. By having the right professionals in place, as shown on the right side of the screen, with the owner in the middle, owner's representative surrounding them, or construction manager role, followed by the architect and the other engineers and subconsultants, and ultimately contractors, all coordinated together, allows you to lock in a guaranteed maximum price when possible, allows you to limit your risk, allows you to avoid change orders that can be very costly, allows you to avoid work that needs to be redone. There can be huge challenges with projects moving so fast as these do and making sure that all the bases are covered up front so budgets and timelines don't get inflated is extremely important. Your project does not have to cost more money to execute in a coordinated fashion and have it be sustainable in design if desired. Get things done right the first time and it will pay off. 
Now make sure you target the business metrics and KPIs that will drive your business profitability. Be sure you have selected the best site, that you have sufficient power available, you can get the appropriate licensing at that location, have the right amount budgeted for the project, on and on and on before you jump in. This process is truly a delicate balance between risk and reward. The rewards can be massive and the risks can be crushing. Our mission is to bring our experience and ecosystem to work together to maximize the rewards and minimize the risks. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Robbie to talk you through different HVACD system types and why some systems outperform others when using KPIs of business profitability. So we've spent about a decade walking into indoor cannabis facilities of all types, and like you'd expect, no two rooms are 100% identical. But because we're putting a webinar together that has to compare different system types, we've had to generalize different systems, and we did that based on certain key features. So we're gonna suggest that there's three major system types, and that each of them represents an incrementally better approach as we move through the generations of designs. So let's start with the conventional non-integrated design approach. Just by looking at this picture, you can recognize this system type because it has a pretty glaring feature. Hanging from the ceilings are dehumidifiers. The primary HVAC system that you don't see in the room is most likely a commercial system, probably designed for regular commercial or office building type loads. We're used to seeing mini splits or off the shelf packaged rooftop units serving these rooms. This is why we call it a conventional system. It just can't handle the humidity levels required for a cultivation space alone. And hence we have all these dehums installed in between the lights. Now the air coming off those dehums is probably about 110, 120 in that range of temperature or higher. And now how is that now dehumidified hot air going to float down to the plants? Well, it really isn't. And that's why when we take a deep look at the temperatures and humidities in the spaces, we see incredibly inconsistent numbers and conditions of the canopy are rarely where the cultivator would like them to be. The fact is, it's almost impossible to tie all the systems together to achieve room consistency. Most of these rooms have separate thermostats for each of the different equipment pieces. And this is why we call it non-integrated. So there we have it. Conventional air conditioning paired with disparate dehumidification equipment each piece controlling separate set points in a non-integrated fashion. Now there's other problematic things you might notice about the room. Looking closely, you see these condensate drains hanging off the side of the dehums. We found that these condensate clog frequently and the result is dirty condensate water dripping into your canopy, causing all sorts of IPM problems that require extra management. Putting equipment in the room like this is also a maintenance nightmare. Sending maintenance people into a live room to change filters or fix equipment is a biosecurity nightmare for sure. And cleaning all the surfaces you see is almost impossible. So it's just extra hard to keep cross-contamination happening from one crop to the next. So why is all this a problem? The fact is, it's a problem because it costs you money. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll be very clear. People will grow cannabis in these rooms, and a sharp cultivator can do it very successfully. To this day, this is probably the most popular setup for indoor growing. Some people have become millionaires doing it. These people did amazing work with equipment that was commercially available or even just available at the local Home Depot. We congratulate them for everything they've done in pioneering this industry. But now, only in hindsight, we know that cultivators could have been so much more profitable if we could have addressed the items I just mentioned. So as the industry evolved, we ended up seeing dehumidification specific equipment providing temperature and humidity control for the growing rooms. How do I know this based on the picture on the screen? Well, where are the dehumidifiers? They're gone. This is an indication that another off the shelf piece of equipment, most likely a system designed for pool room dehumidification, for example, is serving the space. Now, the best thing about this approach is that the temperature and humidity control are integrated. So this is an integrated system. One piece is doing both jobs, and that means the HVAC has a much better chance of getting the things right inside the room. But the fact is, this is still a conventional system. It's conventional because the equipment we're using may have been designed for dehumidification, but it was designed for human-centric dehumidification. Pool room dehumidifiers are just not intended for the cultivation industry. I wanna take a minute to stress this difference. Serving a space with a pool in it versus a space with plants in it is so very, very different. The biggest difference is 
if I'm swimming in a pool, I want all that water at a nice warm 80 degrees plus Fahrenheit temperature. Frankly, to keep that pool at that temperature it takes a lot of energy. The people who make pool room dehumidifiers know this and they take every last bit of energy from the compression cycle and they put it into the water using special heat exchangers. Now, because the pools need so much heat, they literally have no incentive to make their dehumidification process more efficient. The more compressor tonnage they use, the more energy they can dump into the pool. Why fight it? Look, the HVAC industry has better ways to dehumidify air, but none of those ways make sense to someone building a dehumidifier for natatoriums. Now, if you're asking yourself, so what? The answer to that question is, these rooms are still costing you so much money. And this isn't just about energy consumption costs. Yes, running all those compressors all the time leads to huge energy bills, and that stinks. But in an industry where cash flow and time to harvest are so critically important, ask yourself this. How much more electricity do you need to bring to a building where all the HVACD has 30 to 40% more compressors than it needs? How long is your project going to get delayed because the utility has to do a huge infrastructure upgrade in your part of the city? This isn't just big picture stuff either. Think about what we see literally in this picture. They're still running propeller fans inside the room. Because the people who shoehorn a pool room dehumidifier into these facilities maybe don't have the plant in see they should have, they haven't focused on getting the air where it's needed in the room. This is a room filled with plants, not an empty room with a small lake at the bottom of it. Here's another challenge. The conditions in a pool room are about as constant as you can imagine. But a proper cultivation HVACD system needs to perform optimally throughout a vast range of conditions. Think about the change in load when the lights are on versus when the lights are off. A flower room or a veg room isn't about lowering the humidity as much as you can all the time. It's about keeping the right level at the right time to bring out the best in your plants. The bottom line is both integrated and non-integrated and conventional systems will lead to compromises. Diseases show up in rooms because of the interplay of a pathogen, a host, and the environmental conditions. And I'm not just trying to pick on pool room dehumidifiers. We see server room HVAC or 100% outside air units being applied and they have their own whole host of challenges. But philosophically, this is why the starting point of integrated pest management is cultural control. Cultural control is environmental control. And if your environment is set up correctly, you'll spend less time and less money with physical, biological, and chemical interventions. And you're gonna pull more and better pounds out of your room. And so we land on the not so humbly named Inspire Integrated HVACD system. This is a system designed from the ground up with plant-centric environments in mind. The system is integrated, I mean properly integrated. Control of the temperature and the humidity, control of the lights, the CO2 levels, even the room pressure for biosecurity purposes. See, this is a symphony controlled by a brain that is married to equipment designed specifically for the purpose of enabling plant transpiration. Now, I could probably spend 20 minutes telling you about how the runaround loop around our cooling coil and an Inspire system will cut your power bill by 30 or 40 percent. And if you're someone who's with a utility, that's probably a big deal. But what's important if you're the one responsible for actually growing plants in a room? And what's important if you're actually the one cutting a check for a project to move forward? Well, maybe then the important part of the story is there's a good chance you can install the HVACD without needing that costly utility upgrade. Maybe the important part is that we can modulate every one of the components responsible for dehumidification and temperature control. And this means you can make sure your temperatures and humidities are at the level you want throughout the growing cycle, and day or night. Not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. How about if the important part isn't the box outside the room serving the air into the space? What if it's the forethought of a CFD model before construction that makes sure the air you're sending into the room actually makes it into the canopy? The important part of the story might not even be that. It might be that every minute, hundreds of data points from each room, cultivation to drying, are securely making it into the cloud where you, the owner, or you, the grower, can watch your rooms with one eye on real-time performance and another eye on historical trends. This isn't about a box moving in air, about, about a box moving air. This is about intimacy with plant. It's about intimacy with the construction industry. It's about taking the process of transpiration so seriously and put it in your company name. So if you do all these things right, you end up with a very different triangle. You end up with a facility that actually lives up to the promise. And you end up not using as many swear words when talking about the air conditioning system. It's the reason that HVACD, as we do it, 
is obviously not a four letter word. When the environment around the canopy is conducive to plant vitality without microclimates or in room risk factors like leaky condensate drains, you end up taking more pounds out of that room than you otherwise could have. And every one of those pounds is consistent enough to keep a top spot on the shelves at the dispensary where you've earned the trust to deliver products you want. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that HVACD by Inspire is going to magically earn you money. What I'm saying is that if you have a room designed by people that have cannabis intimacy, it's going to give you the ability to grow a product that people will buy. And not just grow a bit of product. I mean, you're going to be able to fill that room with healthy, high-demand plants. When was the last time you saw a room with three tiers of trays layered into a 13-foot high space? So... The heart of this intimacy starts with data and sizing your equipment right. You need to have real data from real rooms that can help you with the task. Here's an example of some of that data and the simple formula we use to figure out the, point, the peak moisture removal capacity we need for equipment serving a space. Quite simply, we need to figure out the peak pounds per hour of moisture removal the HVACD system has to provide. So we sit down with the project team and get the master grower to give us the total daily watering rate, that is, gallons of water that are going to be pumped into a room on a given day. We multiply that by the percentage of moisture that comes out during the period's highest transpiration, which is when the lights are on. Then we divide that number by the number of hours of the photo period. And of course, because we're looking for a total, uh, because we're giving a total daily watering rate in gallons, we multiply everything by 8.33 to convert from gallons to pounds because we're looking for pounds per hour. And obviously this number changes for our international metric loving friends who use liters instead of gallons, but I think you get the point. The key to this whole equation is the percentage of moisture removed during the day. And to this day, we invest a lot of resources to get the data from live rooms. This is a snapshot from one of those rooms. The blue bars represent water transpired during the photo period. The red bars represent water transpired or evaporated during the dark period. Add them together and we can see the total daily plant water consumption for that room. But more importantly, we see the ratio of lights on versus 24 hour moisture consumption. And this ratio is the percentage of moisture removal I referenced in the previous slide. This is the kind of knowledge that is gonna make sure you're not scrambling to buy portable dehums that you have to wheel into a room three weeks before harvest. But fair warning, look, every room is different. Different lighting technologies, different growing styles, they're gonna have different ratios. Don't treat this as gospel, it'll bite you in the butt. Um, feel free to give us a call. We'll talk about what it means to right size the equipment for the facility you're picturing. Okay, look, I've gone into a deep dive and spent a lot of time highlighting the features you get when you work with Inspire, but uh, it's not exactly a sales pitch. You're gonna hear from Adrian about how to make sure you've got all your bases covered as you realize that dream of a successful cultivation facility. The features I've just mentioned bring real value, and most of them are requirements you need to account for as you follow your bids. If you're gonna try and compare multiple vendors, I hope you understand the limitations that come along with purchasing a veritable truckload of mini splits and dehumidifiers for a screaming price, and how that decision will ultimately prevent you from optimizing the facility. You absolutely can compare apples and oranges and grapes and pears. Adrian, why don't you take it from here and show them how? Thank you, Rob. Uh, I hope what Robbie just went through resonated and you can begin to understand why it's not an easy task to compare multiple HVACD bids against each other. You know, it seems easy to have a plan of calling up, you know, one, three, five different companies that offer environmental control systems, ask for a bid, review them in a couple days and make a direct decision uh, around your design. In the indoor cannabis and horticulture business, since nearly every manufacturer approaches this challenge differently, this scenario couldn't be further from the truth. Now let's dive in and see if we can help unmask some of the details that it takes to get to a point of a true apples to apples comparison. Robbie just walked us through the process to define how to set expectations for your room conditions, temperature and relative humidity and how generally to size your HVACD systems based on moisture removal capacity. This is a process that needs to be born from a collaboration between the cultivation team and the business team. These decisions have huge impacts on the type of cultivation setup that you end up using, the lighting type you choose, strain choices, on and on. And this is why we call this step one of a bid leveling process. 
Once these key decisions are made, you'll be ready to complete a form like the one you see on the screen, which is used to convey the design criteria along to the manufacturer, mechanical engineer, and other project stakeholders. Now, as discussed in my opening section, there are many different ways to go about your project, but hopefully sooner rather than later, you're going to engage an MEP engineer to design your facility. And when you do so, we come to step number two. Ideally, this is in conjunction with hiring the other project team members so that a true collaborative design process can happen. The coordination items can get worked out early and you can have your best chance at bringing your project in on time, on budget, and with the right parts and pieces to allow you to be profitable. Your MEP engineer who has indoor horticulture experience does way more than just create the drawing on the far right for construction permit process purposes. They are an integral part of coordinating the design elements of the HVACD systems between the other design consultants on the project, such as structural, electrical, plumbing, controls, fire protection. These guys and gals are problem solvers, just like us. And as a team, it is so much more seamless to get complex decisions made, like the ducting challenge, as an example, shown on the screen, that's drawn with 3D CAD to detail out the all, all the appropriate ductwork fittings and insulation that were required to get the air to and from the cultivation room and not lose any or gain any heat from an ambient condition that can be 100, 110, 120 degrees in different conditions and locations on a design day. Since just about every design decision has a technical fit or function, as well as a cost implication, having the rest of the construction team involved early helps streamline the process significantly and true value engineering can be done where the overall value of the project to the owner can be integrated into the design and done so for the minimum amount of overall cost. Slightly different take on the way that you normally hear value engineering used, but it's an, it's an important way to, to approach these projects. Now I say overall cost because the raw HVACD equipment or system costs that you get from the manufacturers only tell part of the story. The installation costs play a huge factor in determining your total cost of ownership for your project. And without the ability to quickly determine what the installation cost impact on a design decision will be, there is no true way to know your total budget going into construction and confirming that you have enough funds available. Now this brings us to step number three, which while we know that all of these steps are important, this one may be the most important of the bunch. How do you now compare multiple bids that you've solicited when it may be, one of them may be a chilled water, hot water, four pipe system. One of them might be an air cooled package unit system. One of them might be a water cooled DX system. One of them could be a liquid desiccant system. And how do you know which bid to select? All the numbers are different. Do I take the lowest price? Do I take the highest price? What do, you know, do I take something in the middle? Uh, well, you, you really, you don't have any idea how to make that decision uh, until you consider the installation cost impacts of each of these systems in order to get a total CapEx budget that's required for your project. And we approach this challenge with what can be called a bid form. And it's hard to read because there's a lot of detailed information crammed into one spreadsheet. Um, but we need to know a lot of this detail about the HVCD system, some of which Robbie touched on, um, but many others, uh, to be sure that the systems serving the cultivation and curing rooms have all the appropriate options required to perform the duty of proper environmental control. Now this might be the right type of filtration and air cleaning included. This might be the right type of redundancies in the different parts of the system and units. Maybe it's a room control system that allows the cultivator to focus on cultivation and not monkeying with a thermostat or feedback loop all day. It, maybe it's the right type of startup processes, commissioning, training, spare parts, SOPs associated with mechanical part failures. Is, it, is the air-cooled condenser gonna run at negative 40 in the Alberta winter or 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the California desert summer? The list is long, detailed, and honestly pretty dull unless you're an HVACD nerd like us, but every one of these items is imperative for your facility to operate in a way that allows your plants to thrive and your business to be profitable. This is why we're here for you and why we work together with your design and construction team to be sure that all of the appropriate items are included in the material bids 
the installation bids, and are coordinated together with the design team. If all three of those plates are not spinning in the same rhythm, you are sure to encounter unforeseen costs, schedule delays, or both. And although it is not normally top of mind when selecting these systems today, let's not forget operating costs and potential utility incentives available when deploying a more energy efficient system. These may not be as impactful on profitability in the short term, but will become much more important as the market develops. And since we know that efficient and sustainable facilities do not need to cost more than standard facilities to build when working together with a collaborative design and construction team, why not be ready for that when the time comes? This whole process takes intimacy, acumen, and integrity to perform the comprehensive apples to apples bid leveling in an ethical manner. You might be surprised that when you compare a conventional non-integrated system with an Inspire integrated system, that the project costs are neutral or very close. We look forward to exploring this together. Now let's take a quick recap of where we're at. We've set our expectations for how the facility will operate in step one. We've brought in the right design and construction team members, and we've successfully leveled all of those HVACD bids to determine which partner to choose. Now let's make sure to note that the HVAC system is not the only part of the puzzle that needs this level of evaluation. Choosing the right lights, fertigation system, racks or tables, wall materials, epoxy floor coverings, you get the long list here for your business model, are all equally important. However, nothing takes the place of investing in the building blocks of your cultural and environmental control. Now that all those numbers are rolled up into a total budget, how did we do against the estimated budget that was set at the outset of the project? Are we within the budget? Great, and let's move to step four. If not, let's talk about some financing options. We see three typical forms of financing used in the cannabis space currently, with a possible fourth as a newcomer. The three that are most widely used are equity financing, where you offer part of your business in exchange for capital, traditional financing, which may come directly from a bank or indirectly from a private source based upon creditworthiness, or equipment leasing. Leasebacks are a model that have been around a long time in other market segments and are making an entry into the cannabis business space, but are really yet to be seen if they'll be successful. We don't have a horse in this race, except to say that we can help connect you with some different ecosystem partners who we know offer a fair exchange of value. In the end, it is up to your team to evaluate all your options carefully, read the fine print, and make sure it is a sound business decision for you and your partners to enter into. Keep in mind that in the cannabis business, most manufacturers require significant funds up front and that you will need your funds to be liquid at the appropriate time to be sure you don't delay your schedule. Now let's look at a slightly different alternative to financing, and that is phasing your project. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to phase your project. It allows for proof of concept, the whole measure twice, cut once saying, really offers the ability to gain invaluable experience and reduce your risk by biting off smaller pieces of the dream while you learn the systems that will allow you to scale into the future. But most importantly, this measure twice, cut once approach allows you to preserve more equity and reduce the capital raise requirements. Ultimately, you can maintain more control over your future by not having to raise $10 million to build out the whole facility, as an example, when you could start with $3 million, get operational, become profitable, and then scale up. You don't know what you don't know at the beginning of the journey, and this allows for failure, but not spectacular business crippling failure. You know, it could also be said and called start smart so you can scale fast. Now that you have all of this out of the way, let's get on with awarding that bid that you chose back on step three. If your project is fast track like many are, and since you chose a coordinated design and build process with the appropriate team members already involved, you easily have the ability to release the long lead HVACD equipment into production, which can range from three to five months from time of order to the time that it's installed, started up and commissioned, depending on the particular system type chosen. The design team can get you to the point where enough coordination has been done to minimize any impact that completing the engineering work 
quote, on the fly might have otherwise negatively influenced. Now all that is left is executing on the construction, which with the right team involved is some pretty straightforward blocking and tackling. But don't be so naive to think that issues won't come up. They will. You're just prepared to fix them quickly because the team can look within, within themselves, brainstorm the best possible solutions to the problem, and make sure it has minimal impact to cost and schedule. Easy, right? If only if it was that simple. Challenges always come up on complex projects. It's how your team approaches and fixes them that will decide whether you come out on the other side with the ability to be more profitable or less profitable based on what happens. No reason to dwell on negative situations. Use them as opportunities to look within, lean on the team, and come out stronger on the other side. Now, how do you know whether you have built a profitable facility for your business to operate? Well, I'm glad that you asked. The first step is to harness that data. Take your data and turn it into metrics that you can use to benchmark your business and processes. The most important of these metrics will become the KPIs or key performance indicators that your leadership team will be tracking on a regular basis. Increased plant productivity and expression in equals increased financial metrics in most cases. It's important to focus on the KPIs that drive business profitability. Things here like grams per square foot, dollars per gram, active compounds per square foot, harvest cycles per year, reduced crop loss per room, operating costs per pound are all metrics that will help shape your business success. Also important are other ways to offset, you offset CapEx via things like utility incentives and benchmarking your subsystems like HVACD and lighting as you see with pounds per hour of moisture removal per KW of energy or micromoles per joule on the lighting side. And as it turns out that these need to be top of mind from the beginning of the design and construction process so that all the decisions that are made along the way have these goals in mind. In addition to these metrics and KPIs, pursuing ways to reduce risk throughout the whole process will pay dividends for years to come. We talk about these metrics every day with clients because they're so important to focus on. If our HVACD systems can't make you more money, why spend the money on the right system? We look at things like how does your grams per square foot and dollar per gram get impacted as a result of better environmental control, homogeneous airflow, and removing unnecessary mechanical equipment from inside a cultivation room. Talk about reduction in IPM costs as a result of better cultural and environmental control. Once you're operational, the race car has been built, so to speak, and now we're racing. And it, at that point, it's what can be done to make that car faster, stronger, more agile? What are the five or 10 more plant, you know, what, what are five or 10 more plants per room worth over the course of a year if it's determined your HVACD systems and space planning can allow you to stuff more plants in the room than you originally planned and still maintain stable room control. This is where the fun really starts. I'd like to wrap up with a few key takeaways. Environmental control via HVACD is key to any IPM or integrated pest management strategy. Different HVACD system types provide varying results. It's very important to understand the limitations and risk of each type of system. Balance revenue and risk with CapEx and speed to market, phasing and scalability. And this goes back to leveling the bids using that bid form that we talked about. I wanna mention it's very important to engage your utility early to evaluate potential incentives. This is a step that's often overlooked and when, it's, when they're engaged, it's too late to, to have an impact on your project. And you wanna choose your partners with care. And at the end of the day, know that cultural control is the foundation of success. All right, thanks Adrian, thanks Rob. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A now. 
Let's see. The first question uh, I'm seeing here are, what are the common pitfalls you see with inexperienced construction teams? What are the pitfalls we see with inexperienced construction? I guess, um, you know, from my perspective, it's not having a good understanding of the peak moisture removal rate that needs to come out of the rooms, and especially in cult different cultivation facilities. Um, we see them often undersized. Uh, as well, there isn't much, um, there isn't much forethought to the different states of a room. So a room isn't always full with peak transpiration happening and you need to be able to deliver hot air, cold air, dehumidified and not so dehumidified air at various different times. So, you know, that's, that's from my perspective, it's a very, um, you know, technical engineering challenge that we see. But I think there's also operational issues too. We see a lot of people just dive in and they're trying to do 40,000 square foot in a room space, uh, canopy uh, right off the bat. And this may be their first time doing it at scale and a construction team may be able to execute that, but have you thought it through from a people management side? Do you have enough people to man those many different rooms and keep them operating at you know, even peak operational capacity? So, uh, or anything close to peak, you know, really. Mm -hmm. Age, you probably have other, other things to add. But. I, mean, I think that was, you, you got a lot of them. I mean, it's, it's understanding you know, ha having that intimacy, right, and understanding what it takes to to get the systems, you know, the rooms designed properly, um, and then be able to execute on it. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's a uh, growing cannabis is such a complex, multidisciplinary challenge. It's uh, trying to trying to bridge those knowledge gaps is is super important. Uh, yeah, think just from like the financing perspective, right? Um, even if you've got the construction team to execute it and you've got the, the resources to design your rooms right, are you really going to want to outlay all that capital and uh, not be able to turn, turn proper, you know, proper cash flow numbers um, with rooms that are operating inefficiently? You know, why not start small and go big? It's that phasing question or the phasing topic you brought up, Age. You know, that's what, that's an ex when we see experienced teams doing this, they're always phasing. They never just jump right in. So, mm -hmm. super much. Yeah, seems like it'll be it'll become more and more important as uh, as the industry grows and uh, more competition comes in and price compression sets in. You really, it's, it's very important to to make sure your your cost structure is in check and you're able to produce good product. Yeah. I'll throw Thanks. in there just, just the sort of the concept of trust, but verify and in, in the partners and, and really spending time. I mean, I, I talked through it quickly in, in the presentation, but um, the amount of time and care that should be take, taken in choosing these team members is, is really should be significant. You know, you're, you're, you're pairing yourself with them for six months, a year, two years, three years. Um, and, and you really want to make sure that you've got the right team from the beginning um, to help preserve that capital as best as possible. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, thank you, guys. I, another question. Uh, are there significant differences in HVACD considerations between a closed greenhouse and indoor facility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in the greenhouse space, you have different things you have to manage, lights and lights especially. So you have blackout curtains and other technologies that you have to take in consideration. You know, the thermal load from the sun is a huge, huge challenge. So managing that, um, you know, most people may not, most people don't have the electrical capacity or want to put in the electrical infrastructure to do that with closed greenhouse spaces. So, um, I mean, that, that's a webinar in and of itself. I mean, it's a 40 minute discussion and all the technical nuances. But one of the interesting things that we saw at the last conference we were at was the, except for you know, certain parts of the United States where there is a consistent amount of daylight at every single day throughout the year, as soon as you start getting into Northern climes, greenhouses start to become more and more of a challenge. There's a challenge of putting heat into the rooms um, because greenhouses are, very inefficient insulators. So all this heat gets radiated out through the top of the building out into space. And so you have a whole different set of ch challenges for heating at night than you would have. Got it. 
Do your systems require humidification in the beginning of the flower cycle? Uh, no, no, but that's a great question. We've seen that happen before. I mean, plants are beautiful little humidifiers in and of themselves. When you start to apply these brute force or non-modulating compression or dehumidifying technologies, um, or even you know, try, try to use the economizer cycle and bring outside air in for that purpose, you can end up over drying the space and that becomes like a spider mite challenge. Um, it's a balance of making sure you're cooling the air down where it needs to and not any further so you don't have that dehumidification problem. It's a balance of airflow and temperature and humidity control that, you know, with a little bit of forethought, you can, you can get around that problem and not have to go back and install humidifiers. We see that happen all the time, though. They're pretty cheap to install, but it becomes another thing you have to manage. You know, you've got this, this system spraying water into a room. If the sprays nozzles aren't perfectly maintained, you end up with droplets into our plants, and now you've got a challenge, just like condensate draining. Uh, condensate draining onto your canopy. So, um, yeah, th there's a lot of challenges. Luckily, we don't we don't have that uh, with our systems. Uh, the the importance of modulation. Indeed. All right. Um, another one here: Are both the temp and humidity controlled by one air handling unit? I think that's to mean with one system. Um, yes, we can use one air handling unit per room we can do multiple per room it depends on what the tolerance is for uh, redundancy um, yes but that's the point of an integrated HVAC diesel so this is integrated because temperature and humidity controlled by one piece of equipment uh, typically we're talking about bringing the air below the dew point or sorry to the dew point you need to maintain room humidity and then reheating the air back up before it gets back into the room so that you can maintain the temperature because often going all the way that low on the dew point means that you'd overcool the space, especially when you know the lights turn off and you go into the dark period because someone flips a switch. Uh, you have to have all those processes in place, but yes, our units do both temperature and humidity control from one piece of equipment. Great. Another question here from David. Can you touch briefly on the concept of reheat coils for dehumidification? Sure. Age, you mind if I take this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, either way. Go ahead. Uh, so reheat coils are uh, reheat coils come from the HVAC industry because about I think it was twenty or thirty years ago, uh, most energy codes around the world mandated you could not use new energy to reheat air after you've brought the temperature down to get to the dew point you need for dehumidification, and so to get around this. They were using the energy from the compression cycle and taking hot compressed gas from the compressors and putting it through a coil in the airstream. And we call that the hot gas reheat coil. And it saved you from using an electric reheat coil, basically a, you know, a toaster in the airstream using new energy. Um, it's, it's just more efficient. You were going to otherwise take that hot compressed gas and release that energy. So that's what the typical reheat coil is that we think of. It comes in different forms. If you're using a chilled water system, you might have a four pipe system and you're taking chilled water to get the dehumidification done and temperature brought down on the air coming through the air handler. The reheat happens using the cons condenser loop. So if you've got a chiller making chilled water on one side, you'll be making hot water on the other that you can use as the reheat energy. It's the same philosophy. You're not taking the energy you have to reject anyways to maintain the compression cycle correctly you're putting it back into the airstream to do reading. Uh, another one here from our friend Christopher Lacey. Uh, how was peak transpiration measured and how would you account for pruning and canopy training? So many ways to do it. If you've got a grower with experience, peak transpiration is measured by watching the level of water in your tanks as you water from one day to the next and figuring out how much water you've had to refill back into your tanks for fertigation. Um, and capturing as well anything that you've drained and sent out to the sewers. So if you can watch that, that's probably you know, the most accurate way to figure out how much water is going into a room that ends up in the media and stays in the media and is transpired. You do that for enough days and you can figure it out. Um, the more scientific approach, the way that I think the, 
the guys with lab coats do it, is they have a transpiration test. So they'll water a plant, one plant out of a room, or they'll take the samples from different parts of the room, and they'll weigh the plant, put water in, watch the run out, watch how much water stays inside the root media, weigh that, and then every hour they'll come back and weigh that plant again. So they'll catch the weight of the plant as it changes over time and account for the water going in and out. Um, that is a very granular and scientific way to do it. Um, it's also very expensive. I mean, there's a lot of people you're putting into and out of rooms. There's a lot of measurements to be taken. Uh, we use a sensor system inside of our units to figure out how much condensate is coming out of our units. So um, that's kind of an equivalent that we found to be very effective and we can, uh, using our particular setup, we're within five, 10% in our rooms of what the growers tell us they're actually putting in through the fertigation system. So it's a pretty good number. Um, it took a lot of time to develop it and it's, uh, it's not exactly intuitive the way that we do it, um, but we've been able to come up with a pretty solid system. And so every room that we're in, we know how much water is being transpired. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, it was, it was in relation to uh, pre-construction. And so I think it's, it's about the, the question is more specific to, to pre-planning the, uh, the facility. And yeah. um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about, about a little more about the scientific studies that we've done and the data that we, that we collect from, from the control systems that we have deployed in the, in the field. For sure. So you know, I mentioned in my part, I was talking about, you know, maybe one of the important things is sending hundreds of points of data every minute to the cloud. Um, the data we're collecting gives us back from every room that we're in with all the different types of lighting and all the different types of growing styles. It gives us a reference point for whatever new project we're walking into. Um, I, I wouldn't say we've got it all 100% figured out. I'm sure we'll run into a growing system we don't know um, or we haven't seen before, but we'll come up with a good estimate. And they'll tell us based on a plant canopy square footage number, how much transpiration we can expect from that canopy. Um, and it's, it's funny, but it's not about a square footage. It's actually about the volume. It's about the volume of the canopy. Some people grow high and wide. They're using lights that penetrate all the way through using HPS systems. Those are different than the low penetration we normally see with LED systems where, you know, maybe the diodes are all angled straight down. And so we've got to trellis out the systems and spread it out, but the canopy volume is a lot smaller. All these things add up and um, we use that, we take that into account as we come up with the transpiration, peak transpiration rate we've got to uh, maintain. Oh, great. And just, just one more um, pig, piggyback on that, on that question. Um, how does, how does uh, pruning or removing leaves affect transpiration? You're taking stomata out of the room. So, you're taking out those pores, those wet surfaces inside the leaf, and it'll typically drop the transpiration rate significantly. Um, mm -hmm. But because we're watching the rooms every minute, we know when we have, we've got some really interesting uh, things on a graph that we see, we say, oh, they just trimmed today. Because a room will be halfway through, and the transpiration rate drops, and we're like, oh, they must have just trimmed. And then we'll see it climb back up as the plants redevelop in different ways and start to flower. So it's really interesting. Uh, data. We can spray events, right? I can tell by looking at a graph, oh, they sprayed today in this room because the lights turned off in the middle of the day and the HVAC system worked to compensate and, and fix that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's basically pruning leaves takes out the stomata that are, um, you know, that are directly tied to the transpiration rate of the plant. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So uh, on the concept of transpiration and, and water. Um, maybe uh, there's a question here about what are the best methods to drain humidity from a dehumidifying unit from your grow? Um, maybe you touched a little bit on condensate capture. Either way, I, I thought that would be a great segue because there's another question about um, desiccant based systems and, and uh, geothermal was mentioned in the question. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the ability to have the condensate, you know, we can not only measure the condensate and the water that's flowing out, out of the units, um, but we're able to reuse that and recapture that, or the, the grower can, um, and, and reuse for irrigation if they desire. Um, and that's, that's a benefit of a system that has a condensate drain and a, you know, and a, and a coil on it such that we can, we, you can not only measure that amount of moisture that's being removed, 
through that, but you're also able to to reuse it, um, which is if we were to want to use that as a as a point of differentiation against the desiccant based systems that are that are out there for the most part, um, where you're you're really in effect blasting out that um, that hum that moisture out of the space back into the atmosphere, um, and that's one of it's it's one of the in our opinion it's one of the potential negatives of a desiccant based system. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of great positives of desiccant based systems uh, from an efficiency perspective and an air cleaning perspective and things. Um, very it, they're they're more complex um, and they you need to have all of the parts and pieces appropriately designed and constructed. Um, there's not a lot of good players. Um, out there that know this in, in the really in the way to fully control the rooms. There's a lot of sort of spot type units that are used, particularly in the greenhouse environment um, and in other in other locations. And really in, in some of the some of the standalone dehumidifiers that you see on the marketplace, that you, you may not even know that you have a desiccant based system um, in in your facility currently, um, if you if you have one of those. Um, but it's uh you know we, we really we, we see there we see pros and cons with the different types of systems and the the, the ability to capture condensate and reuse that water to us is a is a big big benefit. Um, geothermal was mentioned and I think it was um, I think I, what I mentioned was water cooled DX systems. So there's sort of you know there's so many different HVAC system types out there and different ways to and, and this is sort of a a detailed question on the type of heat rejection mechanism that you would be using um, uh, on the other side of the equation from, you know, from the air handling unit serving the space. So a water cooled DX system is typically going to be connected to a hybrid adiabatic cooler plant with pumping skid um, or a cooling tower plant or dry coolers or some sort of um, system like that. Whereas, um, a geothermal system, you're actually using either water or the earth, the ground, to use as the heat exchange mechanism or heat exchange uh, medium that, that you're that you're using. Um, and so, it's we, we can go into a you know geo, geothermal in general is a much longer discussion um, uh, topic, really, and we can go into more more about that um, together directly, but. Um, in general, I don't know that I've seen a geothermal project um, personally in the in the cannabis or horticulture space um, to date, but it, def, I'm, I'm sure that it can be done. Uh, it's just going to take a lot more engineering to get there. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you have others to, to add. Yeah, so, you know, geothermal system, when I think about geothermal, I think about um, th the whole point of geothermal is I'm going to store heat in the ground in the summertime, I'm going to take it out in the winter and vice versa. I'm going to um, take heat out in the, in the winter. I'm going to use the cool water in the ground, the ground effect in the summertime, and it just makes the systems much more efficient. I don't know. I haven't done the analysis to figure out if that really makes sense here because the indoor conditions don't change in a well-sealed, well-designed room. So we're always using the, we're always sending to the ground with our loops. Um, so I just, I don't, you know, I, I, I just don't know if they're the right answer or not. Uh, it's a pretty involved uh, design that we'd have to look at, but uh, welcome the challenge. Let's, let's figure yeah. it out. Yeah, it would take a detailed engineering analysis really to figure out if that, if that's the right, the right way to go. Um, but site conditions, you know, you know, it's very interesting. In some cases, you're able to, you're able to use resources around you that, that could allow for it. Another question that came in here uh, is I noticed a plastic duct socked running through the tray of one of your pictures. What's your opinion on the options available for in room airflow? I mean, I think I said this at the, in the Q and A of another webinar we did, maybe the first one or the second one. I'm not sure. I mean, you just have to, you have to get air into the canopy. Um, oscillating fans on the wall, propeller fans, they don't do a very good job. And they're going to cause a lot of stress wherever that direct blast is hitting the canopy. So it becomes really challenging. I think the best system out there is vertical air solutions. It's, you know, very consistent. It is well thought out. And they put a lot of time and effort into it. That plastic tube that we use, I mean, we've, we spent some effort and resources figuring out the right tube to use because we needed some way 
to get that airflow through a room because it is so important. And we would just have to come up with the cheapest way to do it. So is it as consistent or is it as solid as a, you know, rack mounted duct? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, we, have to, we haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison yet, but I do know that our system works pretty well too, and it might be more cost-effective. If there isn't a plan to use anything, then go and find something. I mean, really, it's, it's a 1% to 2% cost of the total project to put those systems in, but it makes a huge difference. That's what I'd say about that. Yeah, and you can see it in the CFD modeling when we run when we run those models. You can you can in the model turn on and off those in rack fans, um, and, and just see see the path of air just going you know finding its way around the canopy rather than through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always think about thermostats on the wall and humidistats on the wall and how the conditions could be drastically different between the those sensors and what's actually inside of the canopy. That's right. Yeah, we're huge advocates of having the sensors right down in the canopy, right next to the plants. Um, you're really going to get, you know, if that's if that's what we're trying to control to, then that's where the where those sensors should be. Yep. Yep. Makes good sense. Okay. Uh, do you guys have a ballpark price per ton for an Inspire system that you can give us? Age takes away. <laughs> You're on this one, Rob. Um, I mean, in, in general, you know, um, for, so first off, dollar per ton is a really hard thing to baseline around. And I, we didn't hit it uh, quite as hard as we normally do earlier on uh, in, the pre in the prepared remarks. But, um, you know, th this is really a, a moisture removal challenge, not an air conditioning challenge, right? And, and tons, of, tons of air conditioning in the way that it's typically typically thought of, you know, it, it, the funny thing about it is, you know, in a, in a refrigeration world, tons means almost, you know, something a bit different. I um, mean, you have a connection to horsepower of compressor um, and things, but um, it, it really, it, there's so many different types of systems that are out there and different types of technologies that are used to do the moisture removal. It almost really doesn't matter what the tonnage is that it takes any given manufacturer um, to, you know, require them in order to do the dehumidification at that given room condition and that dew point, a combination of, of temperature and relative humidity that you're trying to maintain inside your space. Um, so we, we, we like to assert that we use pounds per hour, uh, dollar per pounds per hour um, of moisture removed at that given condition uh, rather than dollar per ton. Um, but we get the question all the time, and it's important to, to know what it is. Um, you know, our, ours is typically in the five to six thousand dollars range per ton. Um, but we're using the, the important thing to note is that we're typically using forty percent of the tons compared to another brand. And so our dollar per ton may sound really expensive. But when you baseline it against what it's really going to cost for that room on a dollar per pound per hour basis, or just at the end of the day, when you get down to the bottom and look at the total price, we're going to be right there neck and neck with another system that's 2500 bucks a ton or $3,000 a ton. Um, and we're talking about, when I say that, we're talking about the entire, the cost for the entire system for that room, right? I mean, we're not just providing an air conditioning unit, shipping it out to you and saying, good luck, go to it, you know, find a controls contractor to locally to do it, or, you know, go find, go find some in-room in uh, in airflow devices and, you know, buy this, buy and buy that. Um, this is a full, complete system for that room. Um, and I, so I think that's something that's also overlooked um, when you just ask for a dollar per ton. It's typically referring to, oh, just, you know, I'm just going to buy that, that package unit and throw it up there and, you know, it's 1500 bucks a ton or two, 2000 bucks a ton. Um, it's like, well, no, at the end of the day, once you add in all these other things, you didn't have the right air cleaning and the right filtration available in there. You didn't have the right type of reheat available. Um, and all these other things you start to add up. And that's the, that's the importance of that bid form that we talked about. Um, but you start adding all the rest of that stuff up and you're going to get close to or, or above uh, what we've just shared. Um, and we like to approach it with our clients just from an eyes wide open. This is what it's going to cost 
total full, you know, for the entire system so that your room's up and running. You've got pressure control in your room, you, the right type of odor control for the exhaust, um, the, the CO2 life safety purge that's required by code and for, for life safety purposes. You know, all of those things are so important. Why just like leave those to be, to hope that they're going to get, uh, that those holes are going to get filled on the project um, when you can really can, can scope it all together. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do dollars per ton, go, go to Home Depot and buy a five ton split system, right? I mean, that is going to be your cheapest dollar per ton, but it's the, I mean, it's the difference between non-integrated conventional, integrated conventional and inspire integrated. Um, I hope that I made that comparison clear enough. I mean, that, that is really the difference. Are you getting a unit that's intended for cultivation systems and cultivation facilities and has all those other features that are going to make you so much more efficient and profitable at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Seems like sometimes the, the, the cheapest option up front may be your most expensive in the long run. Oh, we use an iceberg, right? The iceberg. The iceberg, iceberg analogy. Yeah. Careful where you steal the shit. Right, right. I uh, got one coming in from Amy Brown here. Are there any specific state compliance regulations that you've come across that hinder the operational planning for cultivation facilities? Um, she's asking yeah, from Illinois. Yeah, this is this is a great a really great question um and it's it's a moving target really i mean you know we were just we we're in the last week or so reviewing the california title 24 um, per, um uh, draft case report about the projected 2022 code updates for california um, which for for anybody in, involved in the building and construction um, world knows that uh, most pro fairly progressive states will take California's Title 24 um, and, and apply that as their energy code and, and building standard um, as, a, as a sort of an easy, easy way to piggyback on somebody that's already gone through and done it. Um, and there's a lot, we're, we're very involved in this. I mean, it, so in general, there's really almost no codes and standards save for a handful around the country. Massachusetts has a few, Illinois has a few, as Amy's mentioned, um, in, in the way that they've written it. But more and more jurisdictions need to want to get this done, and so there's a bit of a race right now, I think, going on around industry with within industry organizations um, and other stakeholders, you know, both on the utilities side and the, you know, public utility public utility commissions of the states, uh, the utilities themselves, the um, design and construction professionals, the people that are involved from a cultivation perspective, I mean, they're, they're getting a lot of input from all the different stakeholders, which is great. Um, but a Amy's somewhat specifically referring to a code that came out in Illinois that wasn't even part of their building code, from my understanding. It's part of their cannabis code uh, that basically specifies and stipulates that you should be using mini splits for your system, smaller facilities, and VRF systems for your larger facilities. Um, it, you know, and, it's, and then it says, or, you know, kind of in as an afterthought or more efficient alternatives. Um, I, it's so challenging to see a jurisdiction take on a, a, a particular system type into their code. You know, it, it should be a performance based type metric, not a here you must use this type of system type of an approach. Because uh, like we talked about, we, we didn't we didn't specifically mention VRF, variable refrigerant flow systems earlier on in the different system types but they're they're there in that you know that non um, non-integrated conventional type type of scenario where you're, you're needing standalone dehumidifiers so in effect what illinois has done with that scenario is they've said this is the best way to do it and when i think in general we all know that yeah there's a lot of leg legacy growers that have had great success with that but that's coupled with really robust, you know, strategies around IPM, you know, pest management control and, and the rest of the, the other ways that they're able to, to mitigate their environmental challenges um, that, that end up um, rearing their heads through those, through those types of systems. Um, so it's, it's just really important, I think, for, for jurisdictions to understand as they go into through this process that they need to find real world and performance based um, th things that are, you know, that are, that are practical in the space. Um, we're involved in some projects in Illinois right now where um, 
you know, our, our system is just going to absolutely smash the performance of that VRF system that they call for in the code, um, yet provide them like with a significantly better environment to work with inside of those spaces. And so it's, you know, it's a bit of a win-win in that perspective and hopefully we'll be able to garner some, some utility incentives as a result of it. But um, I, I do feel like that's somewhat leading many cultivators down the wrong path by, by uh, forcing that on them. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, got, a, got a nice controls question here from Andy. Uh, do you typically see all wired sensors inside the canopy? or are wireless options available to provide future flexibility in sensor location? Yeah, absolutely. We see <coughs> a lot of wireless options coming on the market. Um, all of our sensors at this point in time are wired, but we're talking to people and we can integrate with anyone's sensor. We've got a sensor array deployed by one company that can communicate through the Modbus or the BACnet or some, some sort of internet protocol. We can pull that data out and use it effectively. Um, I have a bad taste in my mouth for wireless sensors, especially wireless sensors in a uh, industrial process type setting. Um, we find that a lot of these rooms are very busy. They're noisy electrically. They get hit with spray from time to time. And there's all sorts of challenges there. And so I've seen them used and I've seen them not work. And so to this day, you know, our systems, we send them out with wired sensors. I look forward to the day where we can just use a wireless sensor and know it's going to get all the things it needs to from just being wireless. I'll tell you one of the challenges is we put all of our sensors in an aspirated box. For us, it is the most reliable way to get data from the canopy. Yeah, I need to power a fan on a box that sucks air through so I don't expose the sensor to those nasty industrial conditions. That power has to come from somewhere. Now, I don't have a solar panel robbing lights from the plants. I have to run a power line to it anyway. It's going to make wire to power the fan. It's just as either easy to bring multiple conductors over and get the sensor data out. So uh, I don't know if that really answers your questions. There are options available. I can't, I can't speak to any of them right now about their efficacy or whether I'd want to use them. Okay. Well, uh, let's do one final question and... Um... And, and bring this presentation to a close, guys. Um, is there any chance we can get a copy of your bid form? All day. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it probably would would uh, you would appreciate some conversation along with it, so that you understand um, how how it really comes you know, comes together, make sure that you don't miss anything uh, through that process. So yeah, we, we would be happy to talk you through that. Um, if you get in touch with us, that's no problem. Can I, can I just throw in there too? Um, look, it's a bid form that we've built and we're HVAC environment centric. And I'm sure that there are people in the lighting industry who have as much um, expertise and knowledge on their specific field that could highlight and include more items in there. You know, we were looking at the uh, conventional integrated system and we see all sorts of things in that picture that we don't like like you know th there's wiring hanging out all over the building you know that adds costs costs that are probably not captured in our bid form properly or appropriately but someone else with a little more expertise in those areas for you know wiring the lights we'll be able to show you how you can save money up uh, save money up front in your installation costs and end up with a more robust system in the long run and tap us for that network as Adrian mentioned, we have a network that's that's wide and deep, and we're some of the best brains in the industry. So I'm happy to share that too, along with that bid form. Fantastic, fantastic, great. Well, I hope that uh, the, this last hour was informative for everybody, and um, really appreciate everybody joining us again today. Um, if there are specific questions that uh, you have, uh, or, or ones that we didn't answer or answer well enough. Uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, we're available to, to talk and, and, and help answer questions uh, at any point. So on that, unless Adrian and Rob have anything else, uh, call it closed. Well, I think we're good. Be safe, wash your hands, wear a mask as applicable. And uh, we look Indeed. forward to seeing everybody soon. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again.